My grandfather had, uh, I can remember as a little boy, and we called him Papa, and on his front porch there in Manville, and of course he lived out in, out in the middle of nowhere, had these, looked like tin cans, or you know, like they're about this tall, about they're square. They were the uh, hay rations from the First World War. And us kids used to get them and uh, had a, a, a thing that you'd put on there and you'd turn it to open it up. Well, we, was, we wanted the chocolate out of it. <laughs> Interested in the rest of it. There was a chocolate bar that came in the sea rations. And it was hard as a hockey puck. And the little kids were always trying to, oh, give me, give me, give me, G.I. Number one G.I., give me candy. You throw them bar, those candy bars out to them, they'd throw them back at you. They wouldn't even eat them. <laughs> the worst sea rat item uh, was the fruitcake. Uh, it, you know, I don't like fruitcake anyway, but some of the sea rats we ate in Vietnam, you know, as far as I remember, were older than us. Those things are like, you know, they're, they're perpetual. They're in cans, and I think they don't spoil or something. But no one, no one would eat the fruitcake. From time to time, you know, you'd want to trade stuff in your, in your, in your sea rats or other guys for something you like better. But if you got, if you got pound, I mean, a fruitcake, it was, it was, nobody wanted it. So it was worthless in, in the trading of it. Uh, you know, the best thing, although, you know, a lot of guys didn't like it, was the spam. I mean, it was meat and and uh, it was protein. It had a little bit of a taste to it, so I guess the Spam I like best, the fruitcake, I hated. You get your little sea rat pack, you open it up, and you get a little package of toilet paper in there. You get a little pack of cigarettes that had four cigarettes in it. You get a book of matches. Yeah, you get a toothpick, uh, some salt and pepper, and some sugar. It was One was lima beans, and another one was like uh, roast beef or something, and you know, they didn't really appeal to us much at all, you know, until we got thinking about it. Well, why don't we just start getting creative and putting stuff with it, you know, to make it more palatable. Um, and there was, well, beans and wieners was a good one. Uh, that was always a popular one. Um, but the lima beans and some ham and lima, ham and limas, the ham and limas, no one really wanted those things initially, but you know, after a while, when we found out we would add stuff to it, and I don't recall what we added to it, um, it, it they, those became as valuable as the beer did. One of the things that helped us a lot was after they came out with the Long Range Reconnaissance Patrol, uh, anytime we could get a hold of some LERP rations, even if we had to steal them, we would take them because uh, you only needed water. It didn't have to be hot water as long as it was and just water to reconstitute them. And there were some pretty good meals in those. Ham and eggs was pretty good, especially if you could get it hot. They were all better when they were hot. There was a can of spaghetti that was really pretty good. Little ham and lima beans and that one with green eggs and something. I had those, <laughs> if I had those, I, the whole time I was in the Army, I always traded those with somebody that, that wanted them. There was such a, a turmoil and people hating the war and hating everything else. They told us in Okinawa that uh, we were not gonna be well received when we got back. Uh, they told us that people would throw eggs at us. They told us that people would throw stale tomatoes at us and those kinds of things. Uh, whenever you drove your car, if you had your uniform on, you'd get tomatoes thrown at you. A couple bricks were, were in hands, but never, never got thrown in my window. Well, when we were on the plane, they were telling us, you know, when you leave San Francisco to go home, do not wear your uniform. And you know, we didn't, we didn't know what was going on at home. And uh, when we got home and landed in San Francisco, uh, it was, it was not pleasant you know, at all. If you don't go through it, then it's all hearsay and you don't really know what it was or what it was like. Well, I did come back. 
And of course, in Vietnam, you don't have any regular clothing. All you have is military fatigue. You don't even have a dress uniform. So when I come back into, I believe it was San Francisco, they issued us new Class A clothing. So you walk out the gate dressed in a brand new uniform with all the medals and everything on it and you have to start dodging people so you don't get spit on. As we were coming in to land at LA International, uh, a, a man sitting kind of catty corner from us over there turned to us and he said, he said, Marines, you, you might should take your colors off, the ribbons kind of telling your story that you're in Vietnam. He said, you might want to take your colors off so people don't know that you're Vietnam veterans. And so while we were kind of talking about that, whether or not that was the right thing to do, a big bass, baritone voice from two or three rows back heard that. We never, I don't know who it was, but he said, you Marines, wear your colors. Show your colors. And, you know, that was enough for us to leave those colors on as we, as we left the plane. The abuse that we received, we didn't understand that um, for having been over in Vietnam. Um, and that, that that went on for quite a while. And even when I got back to the little small town that I lived in, there were few people that would come up and shake your hand. It was just one of those things where you ended up having to wear your civvies and, 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 and change and drive out of the base, not in uniform. You never walked around in uniform any place. I remember that my wife met me and my oldest daughter at that time was three years old and she, there was a guy standing in there, you know, blocking it. Nobody's gonna go out to the, on the tarmac to the plane. And I come in on one of those little 20 passenger planes and landed and I'm coming down that little stairwell thing. And my daughter ran right between this guy's legs and it looked like she leaped about a hundred feet, you know, and just landed in my arm. <laughs> and that was a, that was a great feeling. I guess the first good thing when I got home, and I got that before I got home, and that was I wanted to go get a milk, vanilla milkshake uh, and a hamburger. Uh, that was high on my list. Oh man, give me a McDonald's. <laughs> get me a Mickey D. <laughs> give me a real beer, a cold beer too. <laughs> a real bathroom, you know, with stools in it that flushed. You didn't have to pull a tub out from underneath there and send it out and fill it full of, of diesel fuel and burn it, you know. <laughs> pull a little handle and it's gone, you know. You know, everything was new. <laughs> Hamburgers, pizzas, everything was new. You know, I, I couldn't get enough of Sonic. It was one of the few hamburger places that I want to go to Sonic for every meal. Um, you know, the family would, get, would laugh at me. But, you know, just the smallest little things. In fact, while we were over there, one of the things we would do uh, is, is we would describe uh, a meal and we'd describe the way it's being made, uh, you know, what we're making with it, how we're making that, uh, the, the way it looks when it's finished and, and the way this tastes, the way that tastes, and what we're drinking with it. And, so on and so forth. That was a great pastime. So, so to get back and to actually be able to go to Sonic and, and have a burger and onion rings and a Coke, wow, man, it was, it was just great. Because for the whole time you're there, you know, we refer to this as the world. And so, man, can't wait to get back to the world because we're gonna do this, we're gonna do that, we're gonna do this and so. So to actually be back, to, to have made it, to have, to have escaped the dragon and to be able to get back and be here and to do the things you talked about for so long and eat the things you talked about for so long was just, it was incomparable. I have some very dear friends on that wall that I served many a years in other parts of the world before Vietnam at different assignments at different places that didn't come back and they didn't see their children grow up, they didn't see their grandchildren grow up. 
Uh, and in my mind, they're like stuck at 29 and 30 years old or older because they're still, in my mind, they're still alive. Right. And they're still, and that wall uh, is a representation of every one of those guys and gals and what they stood for. Um, dealing with anger um, and without medication, I, I don't know what I'd do. Um, because it does, it rewires you. I mean, it truly does. And, um, you know, I, I go to therapy every week. And this, I only started doing this seven or eight months ago. So I lived with it for a long time. You know, uh, I don't need help. I can deal with it myself. Um, you know, I'm a, I don't want to say control freak, but I know that's what got me through what I came through. Um, you know, I, I, to me, I don't know how anybody could go out or go to Vietnam or an incident, a situation like that, or for that matter, in Afghanistan or Iraq, and not come home without having PTSD. I don't know how that can happen, because you know you're, you're trained to kill, uh, and I don't didn't I didn't like it. Um, still don't. I mean, I no, I'm not going there. The PTSD can be very mild or it can be very traumatic and it can come and it can go. And the VA, in all of their wisdom, decided that yes, Mr. Botek, you do have PTSD from an incident in Vietnam and uh, we would be happy to treat you for it if you would like. So I did spend a few sessions with a psychologist. Of course, they don't ever say you're cured. They just say, well, we think you can handle it. Go about your business. And if you ever need us again, just give us a call, pick up the phone, we'll be right there for you. Okay. My approach in life with anything has always been, and I was taught this as a kid, no matter what you do or what you attempt to do or what you're involved with, always look for something that you can say to yourself that there are some positive things that came from it. I learned something. Um, and, and I mean it when I say that I don't know that I can specifically pinpoint anything that made me a better person when I was in Vietnam. To me, it was a waste of time and a waste of money and most importantly, a waste of good lives from it. You know, the Marines changed me. Uh, I can't separate the Marines from Vietnam, so the whole Marines, Vietnam changed me in, in good ways. I came back uh, more disciplined, more regimented, and that has stuck with me through all of life. I came back focused. When I got back in college, made straight A's. So I went to the wall in, in D.C thinking, well, this is not going to be a very moving experience because I've already kind of been exposed to it. But there I wasn't speaking. I was not there in any official capacity. And, uh, and it broke me. It, it broke me. And I don't, I don't know why. I think, I think just to know that all those names, most of those names are 18, 19, 20-year-old boys. Um, they, they, uh, they agreed to put their life on the line, just like all of us did. And they didn't make it. it you know, my name could be on that wall. Other guys' names could be on that wall. 58,000 uh, lost the roll of the dice. If anybody can ever go to Washington, D.C., I've been there three times to, to see the actual wall. It is, it's, it is amazing. And, uh, and the thing about it is, is that the representation that was here, or the re which was like 80% of the actual size, is just as emotional for me as standing and looking at the real thing. Because 
what it represents is that that's a whole generation is just gone. It hits home. It hits home. Uh, seeing the wall. I haven't been to the one in D.C., but I'm going to go, but I don't know how I'm going to deal with it. Um, I'll find out when I go. When you see that thing in the actual size with that black, shiny, marble granite in Washington, D.C., it's, it's amazing, especially when the sun hits it and it bounces those rays back or it's in a, a slightly rainy day and the rainwater's running down on it and it's just glistening like it's, it really, it just reaches out and grabs you. It's just, it's a very sobering experience. I think, you know, all of us have gotten on with our lives and, and established, here I am 67. I mean, uh, I've lived two lifetimes since, uh, three lifetimes since I got back uh, from Vietnam. Yet when I get around that wall, it rockets me back to being 20 years old again, 21 years old again. And, uh, and that's just, uh, you know, I those memories come flushing back. The smells, the sounds, everything about it comes flushing back. Or last summer I went to, uh, California and saw a guy, Johnny Velasquez, hadn't saw him in 45 years. And, and he, at that time, he was, it was in the 101st and then eventually he wound up in the 199th Light Infantry Brigade. And I never was in, the, in, in that brigade, but he called me and told me, I want you to come to the re, our 50th reunion because all these senior NCOs, you know them because, you know, the infantry's not that large of a, organization, basically. He said, you know them and they know you. He said, it don't make no difference whether you were there in, in that unit. You just have your butt here. And I went and it, I was so glad I went because I saw a lot of guys I hadn't seen in 50 years. And, uh, and I'll never forget my wife told me, she said, I never thought I could ever sit in a room with uh, 400 guys with PTSD at the same time was all laughing and carrying on. <laughs> she said, it was, it was amazing. I was glad I went. Today you have young men and women now putting their lives on the line and losing their lives and receiving much more praise for their sacrifice now than those of us who went before them did. But there still seems to be a diminishing of patriotism, which I, I, don't, I don't understand. I was told once, pay attention to history because it repeats itself. Just like fashions, women never throw clothes away because sooner or later they're gonna come back into fashion. Well, we, the future generation has to be aware of the history of this country and what has happened in the past and, be, and remember that what they say, that history has a tendency to repeat itself. This is still a good country. It's, it's the best country in the world. There are approaching seven billion people in the world. Only 330 million of us live here in this nation. And yet we're so blessed. We're so very blessed. And to a large extent, maybe entirely to an extent, it's because of young men and women who are willing to lay their lives on the line um, and pay the ultimate price. And everyone should be grateful for that. And I remember when my grandfather passed away and I was in the Army, I thought, wow, boy, did I make a big mistake. I could have learned all the things from him that he knew starting from 1900 forward. So I tell my grandchildren now, uh, anything you ever want to know about my past or how things were or what do you remember, you feel free to ask. Because when I'm gone and people like me are gone, who are you going to ask? Thank you.